Well, hi, and uh, welcome, everybody. Let me welcome you to the seminar. The title is <coughs> Relational Theory, that's Relational Database Theory for Computer Professionals. And uh, this is me, Chris Date. And please call me Chris if you ask questions. And yes, by the way, please ask questions anytime you like. Notice that this is supposed to be for computer professionals. Um, in fact, on the next slide, I've spelled out what I'm assuming. I'm assuming that you are all, all computer aware, and in particular, you know something about programming. And in particular, you know at least one programming language reasonably well. Of course, that's not a very demanding prerequisite, but that's what I'm assuming. On the other hand, I'm definitely not assuming that you know anything about databases. I'm going to start right from the beginning, and so, which means the first few minutes are going to be possibly a little boring for some of you, and I apologize for that. But <clears throat> you probably do know that essentially all modern database systems are supposed to be relational, whatever that means. And part of the purpose of this seminar is to tell you what it means. So my objectives are, first of all, to explain the basics of relational databases. And more particularly, I want to describe what's called the relational model. The relational model is the theoretical underpinnings of relational database technology. To say it again, I do not assume you know anything about databases, be they relational ones or other kinds of databases. In fact, I need to say this. If you do know something about databases already, I'd like you to pay special attention, because you may find you know some things that ain't so. By which I mean you may find you have to do some unlearning. And I think we all know that unlearning is very, very hard to do. And another preliminary point, some of you will know that I have another uh, video and a book indeed with O'Reilly called SQL and Relational Theory. That's kind of a companion to the present seminar. It covers some of the same territory, but the difference is this companion seminar is very definitely addressed at people who do know something about databases ahead of time, people who have been down in the database trenches for two or three years at least. Um, by contrast, here I'm assuming, as I said before, you know nothing at all about databases. This one is really for beginners. Oh, I mentioned SQL or SQL. I should briefly say, that you probably know this, SQL is the standard language these days for interacting with databases, and I'll have more to say about that later on as well. So here's the overall plan. Part one, I've called it the foundations. That's where I really want to explain the relational theory. To me, that is the most important part of this seminar. Part two, I'm going to take a look at this SQL language that I just mentioned. And in between the two, I have a sort of entr'acte where I'm going to talk about a couple of things that aren't exactly part of the relational model as such. But if you're going to claim honestly that you know something about databases, you need to know about the particular topics I'll be talking about there. So I'll explain later what's covered in, <coughs> in that entr'acte. By the way, I, I should mention there's a book uh, based on this seminar as well. It's an O'Reilly book. It has the same title, and here it is. So as I said, I'm going to start right at the very beginning. And again, I apologize if this is um, very obvious stuff to you. I don't mean to talk down, but I have to assume that you know nothing. So basic database concepts. First question, of course, is what is a database? And a very sort of glib kind of definition is it is an electronic filing cabinet. So it's a place where you keep information, but you keep it electronically. So we, the information is digitized, or data, we call it. It's kept in some form of persistent storage, very typically on magnetic disk. And then if you're a user of a database, then think of it as a filing cabinet. Obviously, you can put information into the database. You can insert new information. You can also delete existing information you don't need anymore. You can change existing information if you have to. And of course, the real point is you can retrieve information from this database when you need it. Um, I said user. Um, actually, the term user covers a multitude of sins. The way I'm using it in this particular seminar, it has two basic meanings. It can be an application programmer who's writing programs that interact with the database, or it can be an interactive end user. But when I say an interactive end user, I still mean a computer professional, not what you might call a genuine end user who, who probably doesn't need to know the kind of stuff we're talking about in this seminar. 
but a computer professional end user does need to know this stuff. So how do you insert and delete and change, retrieve things? Of course, you do it by issuing requests or commands to the database system software. Uh, personally, I prefer request. It, it sounds a bit more polite than command, so I will stay with a request. So you issue requests to the system. And of course, in practice, there are many different ways that those requests can be formulated. Very typically, they'll be done by some kind of pointing and clicking. But for our purposes in this seminar, it is more convenient to assume that all requests are formulated, formulated in text in some formal language. For example, in a personnel database, you might be able to say something like emp where job equals programmer. And that is a retrieval request. You're asking for information about employees whose job title is programmer. So I will always assume in the seminar that requests are always formulated in text form. Now, <coughs> we're going to use a running example. Some of you may have seen this before. In fact, anyone who knows me would be very surprised to see a seminar from me that did not talk about the suppliers and parts database. I don't know if you know this, but there are only three databases in the world. There's um, departments and employees. There's courses and students. And there's suppliers and parts. And by the way, my contribution to this field is that I invented the courses and students database. <coughs> but I digress. This is the suppliers and parts database. And as you can see, it contains three tables or files. Um, S, which is suppliers. P, which is parts. And SP, which you can think of as shipments of parts by suppliers. So for example, right now it turns out the supplier S1 is shipping or supplying part P1 in the quantity 300. So we have a bunch of suppliers, actually five of them right now. Each supplier has a supplier number, which identifies that particular supplier, and a name and some kind of status value, which you can think of as a, a measure of how, how good, how reliable this supplier is, and a city. And for the sake of the example, which of course is very, very simple, I assume that each supplier is in just one city. Then we have a bunch of parts, um, actually six right now. Each part has a part number, which identifies it, and a name, and a color, and a weight. And this is the city where parts of this particular kind are stored. So for example, all part sixes are kept in a warehouse or something in London, let's say. And again, for the sake of the example, which is extremely simple, I assume that each kind of part is kept in just one city. And then as for the shipments, again, I'm going to make an assumption. I'm going to assume that at any given time, there can be at most one shipment of a given part by a given supplier. And under that assumption, no two rows in this table have the same supplier number, part number combination. Okay. Now, that is going to be the running example for most of the seminar. And so I made a poster version here. This is exactly the same as what's on that screen. I'm going to leave this up on the, um, on the easel here as long as I can. Um, <clears throat> of course, I realize that this example is terribly simple. In fact, it's oversimplistic much more simple than any real database is likely to be. The trouble is, if you try to use a more realistic example, you lose sight of what is actually going on. You can't see the forest for the trees. Believe me, this example has been very carefully tailored to illustrate all kinds of points that we need to be talking about later on. So I'll leave that up here as long as I can. It's worth trying to make yourself familiar with the example. Remember at least that there are three tables here. I say tables, they're like files in the conventional computing sense. As a matter of fact, jumping ahead of ourselves for a moment, they're actually relations. But we don't know about relations yet. For, for the moment, files or tables will do. So try and remember what the tables look like. Try and remember what columns they have. It's not so important to remember what's actually in the rows, though if you could do that too, it wouldn't hurt. So this leads on to the notion of database system architecture. Again, again, this is a grotesquely simplified picture, but it captures the essence of something important. Up here we have the example, suppliers, parts, and shipments. 
And I've called that a logical database because, of course, we all know that physically inside the system, the data is not represented exactly like that. There's all kinds of horrible sordid details of physical representation. We distinguish, therefore, between the logical database, which is the database as seen by the user, versus the physical database, which is the database as physically stored inside the system on the disks or whatever it is. Down at the physical level, there's all kinds of horrible details about things like stored files and indexes and all other stuff, which you don't need to know about as a user. And in between the logical and physical levels, we have a piece of software called the Database Management System, or DBMS. So the DBMS is what allows the user to think of this physical database as if it were a logical database. The user here issues requests, like give me information about suppliers in London, for example. That request is formulated in terms of this logical database. The DBMS interprets that request and executes it in terms of the physical database. So the DBMS hides the physical database from the user. That's one way to look at it. So the, what I call the logical database, you can define that as the database as perceived by the user. And it's an abstraction. It's an abstraction of what is physically stored inside the system. The physical database is the database as perceived by the software. And by the way, that's still an abstraction too, of course. Um, <clears throat> you know, underneath that level, there may be other levels of things like disk pages and blocks and things like that. Underneath that, you have bits and bytes, which are internal abstraction and all the way down. But the first level, this is what the user thinks the database is, and this is what the DBMS thinks the database is. And this separation allows us to achieve a very important goal called data independence. Now, actually, that is not a very good term, but we're kind of stuck with it. It's the term we've been using for 40 years. Data independence, if I back up for a moment, data independence means we have the freedom to change through a physical database without changing the logical database. If you change the physical database, you simply change the mapping between the two as handled by the DBMS. And that means we can change the physical database, which we might want to do for performance reasons. In fact, that usually is the reason. We can change the physical database without changing the logical database. And therefore, all your investment in existing applications, existing retrieval requests, existing people, existing training, as a matter of fact, existing database designs as well, all of that is still good. So data independence translates into protecting the user's investment. It's really important. I'll have more to say about it later on. So that's what a database is. What is a database management system? Well, we've seen it's kind of an intermediary between the logical and physical levels of the system. In fact, what it does is support the user interface. It supports the user's perception of what's going on. And it accepts requests from the user and responds to them or executes them against the physical database. Both query requests and update requests, these are terms of art. A query request is a retrieval request. An update request is anything else. For example, request to insert something, or change something, or delete something. So what you can say the DBMS does is it protects the users from the data, by which you mean it protects the users from the nasty, sordid details of the way the data is physically represented inside the system. Just like in a programming system, the programming language, in a way, protects the user from the nasty, sordid details of what's actually happening inside the machine. You might also say, in a rather glib way, it protects the data from the users, by which I mean it provides certain controls, security controls, concurrency controls, integrity controls, and recovery controls. Let me very quickly tell you what those are all about. Security controls, these have to do with the fact that very typically one database is not private to one user. 
one database is typically shared among many users. So you might have your data in there, somebody else might have their data in there. So you need control. So my data is private to me, for example. You can't see my data unless I allow you to. So security has to do with making sure that users can perform only the operations they're allowed to perform. I'll say a little bit about that one later in the seminar too. Concurrency also has to do with the fact that very typically databases are shared. Many users can be using them. Many users can be using them at the same time. And so you need controls to make sure that concurrent users don't interfere with one another. I mean, it would be very annoying, for example, in a, in a theater ticket reservation system, if you went to the system and said, do you have a ticket to see a particular play on a particular night, do you have a seat? And the system says, yes. And then you say, OK, I'd like to buy that. They say, sorry, it's been sold. <laughs> that would be an example of concurrent users interfering with one another. Concurrency controls are intended to prevent that kind of situation. Operations performed by one user aren't allowed to interfere with those performed by another user at the same time. Integrity controls, well, a database is a very important thing. And perhaps the most important thing about it of all is that the data inside the database is correct. Because you're going to base all kinds of decisions on what you learn from the database. So integrity controls have to do with making sure the data is correct insofar as possible. For example, if you try to say employee Joe has worked 200 hours this week, that's clearly impossible. And the system should reject an attempt to do that. That would be an example of an integrity control. I'll have a lot more to say about that one later. And the last one, recovery controls. Uh, a nice way to think about this is the database must never forget anything that's been told. If you've put some information into the database, you must be guaranteed that it's there, even if there's a system crash or something like that. That's what recovery controls are about. I have more to say about those later, too. Oh, yes, a little piece of terminology. I don't know why this is, but it has become extremely common in our business to use the word database to mean a database management system. The database is a repository for data. The database management system is a piece of software. They're not the same thing. The trouble is, if you use the word database to mean a DBMS, what do you call the database? So please be aware of this. If you read stuff off the net or something, you'll find this all the time. People talk this way. I am not going to do that. When I say database, I mean database. When I say DBMS, I mean DBMS. And that's the end of my preamble. And I apologize if, that, as I said before, that was talking down. But we had to go through that material just to give you a basis on which to build. Um, so let's take a little break now. <laughs>